Welcome back. It's the Big Blue Banter, New York Giants football podcast. I'm Dan Schneier, joined as always by my host, Nick Villato. I want to do a whole podcast on the combine on the offense side of the ball because there's a lot of quarterbacks I want to talk about, running backs, receivers, and receivers and offensive line. That's like unbelievable in this class, Nick. Just unbelievable. And some tight ends that caught our attention as well. Some we mentioned on the last podcast. You'll hear us talk about them again and in greater depth, but. I mean, I want to start at the top here and then get your take on it. My biggest takeaway is just how insanely talented this wide receiver class is. Oh, yeah. And I know people say it a lot about a lot of different classes. To me, this is the best one I've personally seen. And I think, you know, competing for that is 2014 when it Definitely. was Watkins and Odo, OBJ and, and the two others. That, that, Mike and, Evans, Brandon Mike Cooks. Evans and you know, Brandon Cooks. Like there's just bang, bang, bang. I think we're forgetting, we're forgetting a couple. I think Allen Robinson be, was in the second round, but there's Alan like Robinson even a better round. I think there was a better there, one in the first round. Than one there might have been one more in the first round. Yeah. yeah. But honestly, Marvin Harrison Jr., Adunze, and Neighbors are as like as good as those prospects, if not better, to be honest. Like Watkins didn't end up being what he was supposed to be. Obviously, that's, you know, all, not all prospects do. But then, then you're talking about like the next year, like Brian Thomas, like A.D. Mitchell, Worthy, like – all these dudes. I even think Keon. I like Keon Coleman a lot. I know some people yeah, are out on Coleman. I like Coleman. I've liked him since I've watched him this year at Florida State. I think he moves a lot better with the ball and in space than people realize for an athlete that big. And it's just crazy to me watching these guys move. And it's borne out by the sets too, Nick, because here's a stat that I'll throw out to you, and I'll, and I'll end it right here, and I'll get your takeaway on watching the offense. But this was, by the numbers, the fastest wide receiver group in the history of the NFL Combine. So it's not just like we're saying, it's not just like, you know, it looks this way. It feels this way. It actually was this way. I mean, the speed was obvious and this is an insane class because it's not just speed. There's size in this class too. There's legit potential X receivers that might be on the board in round two. Which is amazing. And I'm glad you brought up Keon Coleman because I remember watching Jaden Reed and that offense sucked, right? Like Jaden Reed, I feel like not a lot of people were onto him because the offense wasn't great, but I was watching a couple games. I was like, who the hell's number zero? Who the hell's that guy? Mm -hmm. It's Keon Coleman when he was at Michigan yep. State playing opposite of Jaden Reed before he went to Florida State. And I was like, okay, I'm going to keep a note of that guy. I ended up going to Florida State. And he runs like a 4 6 something here. People are like, oh, yeah, he sucks. I'm like, dude, watch the gauntlet. Just watch yep. the gauntlet. And then I think the the uh, GPS tracking numbers came out on Keon Coleman's gauntlet. And it was faster than, might have been AD Mitchell. I think it, I think it, was, it was the fast. fastest of any wide receiver in the class. Okay. So it was a fast. Yep. And, and you see, like, when you're watching the gauntlet, yeah, catching is great. You want to see the catch secure, get rid of whatever. But how do they maintain that freaking line? What's right. their balance? What's their spatial awareness of maintaining the line? Watch Keon Coleman do it. Dude's right down the line. Like the kid from Oregon, who I like, who, who's very fast, Troy Franklin. You watch his, he's freaking weaving back and forth like that. I don't want to see that from my wide receiver. I want to see you maintain that damn freaking line. I thought Keon Coleman did great. Hopefully he slides in the draft and the Giants get him a little later if they opt to not draft one in the first round. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, where do you want to start here, Nick? Do you want to talk, go through position, position? You want to start maybe with quarterback position, or do you want to just kind of take it where we're? Where, so, do you have anything specific you want to touch on? First? So we we spoke a lot. We should start with quarterbacks, right? We spoke a lot okay. about JJ McCarthy on the last podcast, so yep. I don't think we really need to uh, to rehash that and reiterate there with JJ McCarthy. So I say we just kind of talk about a lot of the other quarterbacks there. Firstly, okay. do you like care that that Caleb Williams didn't throw and that Drake May and Jane Daniels didn't throw? Like I would love to see them down there personally. I don't know how much I I, I care. Like I, yeah. I do want to see you throw like selfishly, but if you're just going to go to your pro day and you're going to throw, like a lot of people have been doing that for like the last like half decade or so. I don't really necessarily hold it against these kids. That, like some, some others are, especially a uh, fantasy reporter. <laughs> yeah, that's about to say, make that same joke. I can't believe that dude did that. Whoever that guy was like, he was he proud was, of it too. I was like, I remember watching it. He's like, I asked Caleb a tough question. Then he got destroyed. I always like, thought it was a troll. It was so yeah. bad too. It was just like, yeah. you're a, I don't even I don't want to do it again. The but, it was so abrasive and just weird. It was a weird moment for that kid um, or guy. I don't even know what that if it was a kid or a guy, what he is, but he's not in my fantasy. He's not, he doesn't work for CBS. But yeah, I was going to make that joke. I like that you got there first. No, I don't personally care. I think like we've seen this trend happen a lot. I'm surprised to see when court anyone who does it. And I, you know, one guy I want to talk about who really looked good throwing the football, and this is not a concern of mine for him, but it's still good to see it is Michael Penix. I think he throws a great football, man. Like the way that ball releases from his hand. It's tight. It's condensed. It gets on a dart to the spot. Yeah, I knew you're gonna love those ad adjectives. Uh, but it get, it gets there. My issue with Penix, and I'm gonna watch more tape on him. My only issue with Penix, Nick, is like 
is foot speed. And I really do believe foot speed is so important for these quarterbacks. Like, can you manipulate this pocket and can you maintain this pocket? And when this pocket starts to collapse, do you have the foot speed to do anything at that point? And I'm not just talking about like scrambling to your right or throw, making a throw on your roll a, roll out. I'm just talking about simply like manipulating the pocket to that extent. I feel like he has really slow feet, Nick. So I, I it's like, I'm really, cons I'm just like so torn. I think out of all the prospects, a lot of people are like, my prospect that I can't make my mind up on is JJ McCarthy, right? Or you know, some people are like, my prospect I can't make my mind up on is Drake May because he has all these bad stats and all these things. And I'm weighing those. For me, it's Penix. That's going to be the prospect throughout this class that I just don't feel like I'm going to get a good feel for because I think he throws an incredible football, Nick. And he has some good, you know, some good traits about him outside the football. He's got size. He looks to seems to be like he processes well, throws the ball into space, which I like. Like, I feel like he leads receivers. But with that, with that, with those feet, man, I'm just like, and obviously the medical history is part of it too. But that's the one I wanted to point out first. I just loved how he threw the football to come. I thought he threw a great ball. Yeah, that wasn't a surprise either. Like the ball jumps out of his hand. Yeah. Like you see some of the, the one throw, I can't remember who it was against, but he had to throw up the sideline and cover two, hit the honey hole, like hit the guy in stride. It might have been a new day. I'm not sure. Yep. They, they have a bunch of receivers there. But yeah, he's certainly somebody that I'm kind of on the same boat with you. I just got to like sit down and be like, let's watch Washington's offense. And when I do that, there's so many draft, but they have the tackles, both the tackles that they have. They have a Dunze, they have Penix, they have the other receivers. There, there's, yeah, There's a lot of talent in there. Yep. Oh, yeah. And that's the, let me get you on that actually real quick because we get this a lot in our replies and I'm curious to get your opinion on it. What do you, where do you, and how do you factor in the quarterbacks who have it all versus the ones who don't at the college level? So for example, like you just mentioned it, Penix has three, basically three stud receivers, like two that Odunze who's going to be a top 10 pick, probably top five, uh, probably top seven. And then two other receivers are probably going to go on day two. In addition to, you know, to, what is it? One offensive lineman who might go in round one. Um, and you know, just a stack Ross and you have LSU where you have, in my opinion, like between Brian Thomas and neighbors, two of the most, that's the most insane one, two at wide receiver since J Jamar chase and Justin Jefferson with burrow. And then you have guys like Drake may who have like no offensive line talent whatsoever. I guess Devontae Walker is a really good player, but I probably around two, maybe even round three pick. And this yeah, drops way too much. He drops a lot of pad. Like, I don't even think he'll go round two, nothing else, horrible o line and horrible defense. Caleb Williams, just, one of the worst defenses in college football history at USC. No receivers going round one from US, or I guess Bryce might go. He might, two, probably not. Yeah, probably two, three, even. Um, battle line there too. So what? Where do you? How do you fact that all in your evaluation process? It's important. It is. Uh, I um so. Michael Penix was thrown from a lot of clean pockets. So what I do is when I do get into his tape and when I have evaluated quarterbacks in the past, I try to really put a lot of um a lot of importance on the plays where they are broken down, not necessarily off script. Those are important. You definitely evaluate them, but when the pockets muddied, how do you react? Mm -hmm. Where do your eyes go? Do you panic? Do you spike the ball? Do you look for your check down? And I try to um, really hone in on, on those events and those plays where, where it really comes down to, all right, the good line that you had failed you. What did you do to rectify that? Or are you only propped up by your good line and the talent that you have at receiver? And I'm not saying that's the case for Michael Penix Jr., but it's uh, it's very beneficial when you have those things for you. So I really want to see how you react when those things do fail you, because they will ultimately fail. You get the best offensive line in the world. There's still going to be plays where it fails you because the defense right. out schemes you. So it really just comes down to uh, that, really, is, is, is evaluating is evaluating these players who are in great situations when the situations aren't all that great on okay. individual plays. That's an interesting way to look at it. I, I like that perspective on it. it it's like, I, for me, I'm thinking about it. Like, so let me give you an example, like Jaden Daniels, when I watch him and I've seen more of him than, and I've seen a lot of Daniels, May and Williams to this point, as far as the quarterback. So I haven't seen a lot of the other quarterbacks. And when I'm watching like a game film of Jaden Daniels, I feel like a lot of what they're doing is like slot birds and slot fades and shit that just like taking advantage of their sick receivers in the space they have. And then other times I just feel like he'll take the ball down and just run and be awesome with it. Right. Like he looks awesome. He makes guys miss. He has these explosive runs. That type of prospect is incredible to get on your football team, no matter what you look at it. But I, how much is translatable? Like when you're just ripping slot fades and you're utilizing the space on the field and you're insane athletes running these vertical routes and creating so much separation, it's like, those are the types of things where I'm like, if a lot of your production is coming from you pulling it down and running it, plus doing that, you're not using the slot fades type stuff and the verticals, you're not really utilizing the middle of the field. How much of that translates to the next level when like that shit just doesn't work at the NFL. There's just not that much space <laughs> to, to operate with. I feel like you need, you need to dive into the nitty gritty and you really yeah. need to pay attention to the details, right? Like 
where is Jane Daniels or Michael Penix Jr. on a certain play? Look at what's going on pre-snap. Right. Think about then watch the play. You see like what the routes are. You know that that's the play right there. Now put it in Michael Penix. That's what Michael Penix says. Then rewind right. it and see what Michael Penix is doing post snap with his eyes and see if there is some sort of adjustment that he made that is different based on what the pre snap alignment was and see if versus he like picked up on rotation. That, right? Yeah. Versus the post snap rotation. Also, you got to factor in like what is the offensive philosophy? Are there choice routes built into this? Are, are they on the same mm -hmm. page with the wide receiver? There's so much that goes into that's why so evaluating many, quarterbacks, so I'm so hard. I'm like, I'm waiting to evaluate quarterbacks a little bit, right? Because it's very difficult to evaluate yeah. quarterbacks. It takes a very long time to evaluate the quarterbacks because in order to accurately evaluate the quarterback, you need to know the offense. You need sure. to have like a firm basis of what the offense is trying to do. So you can at least somewhat, because it's still just somewhat, because there's so much conjecture, yeah. somewhat interpret what that what that what that uh quarterback is doing in every single situation and how much is going through his freaking head, right? Because you want a right. quarterback who is able to make adjustments on the fly and stay calm and stay cool and stay collected, but you have to understand what the coaches are telling them, and that's something that again has a lot of conjecture to it. That's why it's difficult to evaluate quarterbacks. Everyone can evaluate, oh, wow, he put really? a good touch on the football. And like yeah. those types of things, those physical attributes, those are easy to evaluate. But you want to really dive into, like it takes like, it could take like 20 minutes to evaluate a play. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like if you're really trying I to figure know, out yeah. what the hell happened. You We've know? done it with Daniel Jones and the Giants for all these years. Like we know how much it takes to just evaluate an NFL play. I think you make a great point because I feel like when I watch quarterbacks, I get a very early on, I could watch one game and feel like I have a great feel for their physical attributes and how that yeah. might project. And I think over time, I've learned a lot about position. And I think I have a leg up on some people as far as like what traits will translate and what I'm supposed to be looking for physically. But then the mental side of it, dude, I feel we could be completely lost on that. Because like you said, we don't know what the, what, what the system is. Even if you start to learn the system, you don't know what their given intentions are on any given play. Plus, you don't know how much of it is like coach piping in where I want you to go with the football or how much they're doing on their and, own. And, and the defense, too. Like you got to factor True. who they're playing against. Like what is that defensive philosophy? What do they usually right. do? Are they a three safety right. type of team? Are they an odd front team? How does they're that affect pattern match? Like what, are you, what should you be looking for post snap these quarterbacks? And it's hard to know. And, and it is hard. really hard. By the way, but, that doesn't even factor in. I'm sorry to cut you off, but I want to say one yeah. thing. It doesn't even factor in like a third and very important factor, which is how these dudes are off the field. And are they going to be a leader of your franchise type shit? And that's what these guys will never have that information. But that's what like, leads to like total busts like Josh Rosen, and Jake Locker that just don't want it too. like. And you know what I mean? Like, yeah, that's the yeah. other factor. And there's also just like parts of like when you're throwing the football, what do you do with your eyes? And how do you yeah. manipulate defenders? Right, leverage, right, right, right. Like, like if you know you have a high low, and you know that they have a, a whether it's cover four or cover three, whatever it is, they have a deep defender who can be high load. How do you react when you use your eyes to get that defender to bite down? How quick mm -hmm. does a football come out to hit the corner route above right. or over that guy's head? Do you put the necessary touch on it? And those go kind of bleed into the physical attributes. But there's a lot of mental that goes into that as well. So there's just again, there's so much nuance. That that occurs with the quarterback, and and it's also man like a lot of these quarterbacks like what they're asked to do in college might not be what they're asked to do at all know, in the NFL, and, that, and that's know. the coach's job. It's the coach's <laughs> job to coach him, to coach I him, know. to get him to do what he wants him to do. Right, and a lot of that is articulated and kind of understood through the meetings that they have. It's like right. okay, we see what he does, what he was asked to do. We think he's going to be able to do what we want him to do. Now it's our job to coach him up to do that. But even right. if he checks out from a mental standpoint, he does great in the, in the interview. What if he just does not <laughs> you know, like right. there's, oh man, it's, it's, it's wild. I, I love it. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause I see a lot of these quarterbacks that are just basically just doing what the coach is saying on a given base. Like sometimes it's like play to play. They're really yeah. not operating much on their own at that, from that standpoint. And then it's like, they get to the NFL level. It's like, all right, now you have to run an NFL offense. Good luck processing this in real time. So it'll be interesting. We're going to do our best. We're going to do our best to try to get as much of the mental side of it as we can, as you know, we have our information to, and then we're going to cover the physical side of this hard. That's what we do and, with quarterbacks. Like and you a have lot to of, do. Of course. And a lot of that is just on script shit too. Right. Then you have the Patrick Mahomes stuff. Where yes. Patrick Mahomes kind of came in, he's playing backyard football. You're like, ah, that will never work in the NFL. What a loser. Guy ends up doing crazy stuff. And you see Caleb, right. I'm not saying he's Patrick Mahomes, 
but he has that element to him where it's like, oh crap, plays off script. Caleb Williams, do something for us, please. I know your offensive line's not that great, but yeah. do something. And then the guy gets it done. You're just like, there's a magic to that aspect because that right. is translatable, right? Like there is an right. element of just, I have a great feel for how to create and how to get away and escape while keeping my eyes downfield. And if you have a good rapport with your receivers, the receivers will find a way to get open. And if you just have that natural ability, it seems like to locate where your receivers are and get rid of the football promptly, I think that could take you a long way. And Caleb yes. definitely seems to have that from the film I've seen so far. He has that. And I, I think Nate, Nate Tice says it best. It's not just that he has glimpses on film of like, if you get this guy into a, 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 the right system, he can be a really good on time quarterback too. And I think he's the best as the best ceiling by far at that. Cause yeah. you watch his lower half is so compact. The way that he gets the ball out, it's so on time, dude. Like he has so little wasted movement from the lower half. And then the upper half, as far as arm mechanics that, you know, that release is just Aaron Rodgers. So you combine that lower half, that quiet lower half with a Rodgers like release. That means the ball's just getting out fast on time. That's why I really think he didn't show it a lot at USC or he didn't see it a lot. I guess last year year even though the year before he had like 55 touchdowns and two interceptions or 52 and five that 2022 year for usc but like they broke down all the time that old line when i watch caleb williams his line is just shit and then his defense gives up a touchdown every time they're on the field like how hard is that to play quarterback when that happens to me it sounds really hard um but anyway let's move on to another quarterback who was at the combine and joe milton who is intriguing to some giants fans they've asked us about him um, I know you've been asked about it. I've been asked about it. I haven't watched any Milton tape yet, so I can't tell you that. I've seen some clips. Obviously, we've all seen breakdowns of players throughout this process. Some clips where he's missing in in, in you know the short the short range, and I just don't love the release, and I don't love how he throws a football. But at the combine, he <laughs> lined up a seventy yard bomb, and that ball traveled like seventy plus in the air. And then he and obviously, half yards. what was it? Seventy three and a half. Seventy three and a half air yards. I bet you if I went to true media right now, Nick, and I sorted because you can do this. And I look at this sometimes all quarterback throws from the 2023 season, the NFL by air yards. I'm not sold that anyone threw a ball that was that many air yards. I don't know if it definitely happened. I'd be, I wouldn't be surprised if the answer was high 60s for the, the most air yards for any throw. Now, part of that is obviously you're playing against two high safeties. It's not easy to make those throws or to even want to attempt those. But like, and Josh Allen might have done one. But um, Josh Allen and Pat Mahomes are the two that would, yeah, they could only do it. The, the, well, the current Mahomes arm doesn't, I don't know. I, I, you know my theory that I, I didn't feel like Mahomes arm, something was, something was up with it this year. This deep ball was weirdly off compared to usual. But, but Milton, man, and then he had the highest velocity as well. Of the combine, so it's just rips of football. So I don't know. What are your thoughts on Joe Milton? I think he's an excellent developmental quarterback. Yeah. I, we already okay. addressed Joe Milton on the podcast like about yeah. a month ago. Sure. I said, dude, say if you forego going quarterback for whatever reason, you draft Joe Milton uh, in day three if he's still around, and you just give him with Brian Dable and and see if there's something there. Because right. holy crap, is he exciting? But he's not going to be able to complete a pass to the flat, which reminds <laughs> you of Josh Allen. He's like a knockoff Josh Allen, but he's big. He's physical and he has a freaking cannon for an arm. And Josh Allen was a better prospect than Joe Milton. Yes. Like, don't get me wrong. It's just the sense that there was a um there was inconsistent accuracy, I think is probably the best way. It's for throws that seem pretty freaking easy, right? Yeah. And I think that's correctable with really good coaching, right? You get your feet, your hips, your eyes, your shoulders, all right. oriented to your target, and you throw the football. You could make a throw 75 yards down the football field, but you can't complete an out route. Uh, beyond the numbers, like, come on, man. Like, yes, you can. We just got to fix that. And I think Dable has at least a track record, as I said previously, of doing so. He's the one. I mean, look, you. if anyone wants to go back and look at it, go watch one or two game films. You can pick any game from Josh Allen's Wyoming days and you're going to see miss throws in the flat you're going to see him drilling balls into the ground and that obviously doesn't happen anymore when you watch josh allen now with the bills he's never missing those throws i don't think i've ever seen him drill a ball into the ground in front of the receiver that like short hop they remind me of like watching don McNabb. remember the old like the end of don McNabb's reign with the with the redskins where he's just like grounding balls every throw he did a lot yeah. with the eagles too i didn't get to see that, that uh, unfortunately oh, right away. I, yeah yeah but I, I heard about it. I remember being like, wait, so Donovan's going to Washington? I was Washington. like, yeah, it's the end of an era. Dude, like Donovan McNabb for like my for our age group, Dan, like Donovan McNabb, he was the quarterback. When I really started paying attention to, to football, he was a quarterback of the Eagles. So he was a quarterback of the Eagles all throughout my basically childhood into high school. He was there forever, dude. And they I were know. good. And it sucked. And I hated it. It did suck. But bringing it back full circle, we've seen Dable correct this. You know, lower body mechanics, arm mechanics, 
it's possible. Will Milton be the next guy? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, likely or not. Like Josh Allen's probably an outlier if we really look at this thing as far as prospects yeah, go. Probably. And I guarantee he's probably an outlier. Um, so just keep that in mind. What's going on, Big Blue Banter listeners? I'm excited for the football season for several reasons. And one of those reasons is Prize Picks, which is North America's largest independently owned daily fantasy sports platform. And it's so simple to use. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including professionals, sharks, and people who are going to exploit you, you pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections, and you just watch the winnings roll in. It's very simple to play and gives you a little extra skin. I've set my picks in less than 60 seconds. There are so many stats to choose from, and the withdrawals of funds are easy and quick. Dan and I will be adding a segment to our show before every game where we pick our favorite stats, more or less, yards or touchdowns, what have you, and we'll be discussing why from a scheme, matchup, and game theory perspective. I love their promotions and how easy their interface is to operate at prize picks. I may select more on tackles for a loss from Bobby Okereke or Kayvon Thibodeau next game. They also do other sports as well. It's a really cool experience. Please join Dan and I in the fun of prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash banter and use code banter for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, go to prizepicks.com slash banter and use code banter for a first deposit match up to $100. You will not regret it. Oh, my friends, you know what time it is. You're hungry, you're starving, and you desperately need pizza. You should get the best pizza on the market. And that is, of course, Little Caesars. Make Little Caesars the official pizza sponsor of the NFL, part of your game day. Order online during the Pizza Pizza pregame all day on NFL game days and even on Pro Bowl Sunday and get ready for some football fun and cheesy delicious pizza. Choose your favorite Little Caesars pizza or pick the toppings you crave. Either way, you win. And speaking of winning, everyone scores with convenient delivery or our in-store pizza portal pickup. So grab some friends and enjoy a few slices during the game. All right, moving through quarterbacks, I don't think there's anyone else too interesting. A lot of guys sat it out. Um, Let's get to running backs, a class that, you know, going into this thing is probably being discussed as one of the weakest in a long time during this, especially at the top. I think you'll always find depth at running back. You're always going to find guys. I think Nick and I will always find guys we like in the middle rounds, but top of the class, maybe not as strong as it's been. Blake Corm's one of the guys who's in the mix, I think to be drafted first uh, at the running back position. He had an interesting combine with the six, eight, two, three cone, which was phenomenal. Um, what were your thoughts on what you saw from Corm? Dude, I thought Corm looked great in the bag drills, man. Like mm-hmm. really smooth. It's not really a surprise. What does that look like? 18 dudes from Michigan at this freaking combine. They had like six offensive linemen down there. Yeah. Jeez, man, that's freaking crazy. No wonder they won the damn natty. But yeah, no, from what I've seen, uh, what did he run on the 40 Blake Corum? I, I think it was a it four, four five. It was a four five three. So yeah. slightly worse than Ray Davis at four five two. But four fives is kind of what you're getting, unless you are an incredible freak at the running back position. And there was an incredible freak at the running back position. The uh, the guy who used to be at Wisconsin. Uh, how do you say his name? Garando. I don't even fully know Garendo, I think it is. Yeah, he's a Louisville running he's back. Like, he ran a 4 3 3, which is like the same speed, I think, that Achan run. Achan might have been a 4 3 2, but I think Achan just watching, I think he had more play speed. Uh, but I'm also kind of speaking out of my assets. I haven't seen Garando's tape, but I'm just imagining because I haven't really heard of Garando and I heard a crap load about Achan going into the combine. Yeah. So you can kind of uh, correct me if I'm wrong there. Oh, look, Garando is an interesting prospect, but he's just one of those. This is what. So. Just to follow up on what you said, Nick, it's not only that he ran a 4-3-3, which is insane. He was, for full uh, relative athletic score, he's the fifth most athletic running back out of six, 1,765 backs insane. since 87 in this combine. It's like he also had a 41.5-inch vertical, almost 11-foot broad jump. He was 221. Like, he weighed in big, too. A 10-yard split of 151, a 2 5 two twenty. The shuttle was 4-1-5. The three-cone was under 7, 6 nine, four. It's like it's really like everything, explosiveness, change of direction, overall speed, size, two at 220. He didn't look this way when he played at Wisconsin. He played by Braylon Island, and he and he kind of subbed in with him. Um, then he transferred out to Louisville this past year. 
he was good. Like he was a good productive back. I never thought he would ever test like this from watching him on broadcast. I don't watch Wisconsin tape, Nick. So I don't know if it looks better on tape, but I see something like this, Nick, and I get a little concerned with RAS in general, or just like testing in general and how much weight we could or shouldn't or would put into it. Cause I just, this one to me doesn't fully check out. Um, but definitely an interesting prospect. And he's going to, by the way, the NFL, I'm sure this is going to shoot him up draft boards. It is. So I'm looking at his, uh, miles per hour. His max speed was 21.6 miles per okay. hour. So that, that's fast, but there are other running backs who are around that. I, I want to say the max speed for Jalen Wright, who ran a 4.35, if I'm not mistaken, is 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 a uh, is comparable to that as well. And Jalen Wright, I, I've watched tape on Jalen Wright. He's the Tennessee running back, but he's playing in Josh Heupel's offense, man. So like almost True. all of his runs are are from shotgun. They're all zone reads or or power and counter out of shotgun. So not a lot of single back or eye formation runs. And he's not really all that involved as a receiver. But I think there's some, you know, meat on the bone there that has been unchewed on Jalen Wright. Cause I think he could be a good receiver. Like he shows receiving skills. He just wasn't asked to do it. Right. So if you were to select him on day three, bring him in, and then you notice, oh crap, this guy is a capable receiver. There's a couple guys in the draft class who are like that. They just weren't in offenses that were conducive to showcase. They're receiving skills, but capable when they were asked. So Jalen Wright, um, I felt like he was somebody who was going to go and blow up the combine, and he had a solid event down there. I think again, he ran the the uh, four three five, if I'm not mistaken, jumped thirty eight in the broad, which is great. It's not forty one and a half like uh, Garando or whatever, but he had an eleven two broad jump and a thirty eight inches in the vertical. I'm sorry, with a one five five ten yard at two hundred and ten pounds five ten. So he's Pretty another good. player. Yeah, I have a day. Like I think I have a a really, really early day three grade on him. But I think he could be a good compliment who has that home run type of ability that you're looking yeah. for in your second type of running back. True. Also, it's like, we know that the Giants are probably going to let Saquon Barkley test the market, Nick. I think that's where they're trending. No franchise tag. See what happens. I think we're probably at a point where we're probably over 50% if we had to guess now that he won't be back to the Giants, that he's going to find a deal somewhere else for more money. But I don't know if that's a guarantee. But let's say they do go in that direction and Barkley's gone. This might be a draft class where they say we want to retool with a 1A. And if they do want to retool with the 1A, the two guys that stand out the most to me are not Blake Corm and Braylon Allen, who have been discussed in that regard. And again, I've watched a lot of Braylon Allen Wisconsin. He's just not for me. I think just I, I think he could be okay at the end. I don't just if he's RB1 in a class, I'm just stunned by that, to be completely honest. And I just not a guy I want to invest in. But Jonathan Brooks, who we didn't get to see, obviously, for obvious reasons, the ACL from Texas. But the other guy for me was always Trey Benson from Florida State. When I watched him during the season, when I watched little clips that people broke down, I was like, this dude can ball, and I like the way he runs the football. And then he shows up at the Combine, man, and he's in a lot more athletic than I think people realized he was going to be. Just over six foot 216. Again, for me with backs, Nick, I've told you this in the past. I've said on the pod, I don't love the 200 to 205 to 210. I'm looking for like 216, 220, and can you still move at that size? Because that, to me, is the size that turns into the 1A type backs. And this dude at 216 ran a 439 40-yard dash rate, Benson. I did not know he had that kind of deep split. 154 10 yard is great. A 256 20 yard split, a broad jump over 10. Like this dude has some athleticism to him for sure. And I think the tape is even better. So if I'm the Giants, Nick, and I'm not I'm not saying I, I want to do this, by the way, but if if he's sitting on the board and there's a big fault running back since round three, I'm considering it. And if they're gonna do anything, if they're gonna make any kind of splash at running back and try to get their one A to replace Barkley in round two, because sometimes that's where you do. You get the Ken Walkers there, you get the Jonathan Taylors there at the beginning of round two. Benson would be probably the guy that comes to mind. Benson or Brooks are the guys that would be the only ones on my radar as potential. And I'd want to watch more on them, man. And I still don't think I'd get there because there's just too much talent on the offensive line and receiver that is going to be left on the board there and maybe even corner. But if they're going to do it with anyone, Benson's probably going to be my, I just think Benson's going to be my RB1 in this class is the way I'm thinking about it right now. Yeah, I, I like that take from everything I've heard about Benson. Neither watch Florida State's offense, yeah. watch a lot of their defense, did not watch their offense and quite yet. Coleman Other than, too. well, I did see a little bit of Johnny Wilson. So I did focus yeah. on Johnny Wilson. And Johnny Wilson is insane. We'll, we'll get to him in the wide receivers. He's the size of he's the size of Darren Waller at the wide receiver position. Mm -hmm. And he's thick and he's pretty good. He's better than you would think. Pretty right? good. Yeah. He's pretty good. Like you hear not like six foot, 
six foot seven, 238 pound wide receivers. And you're like, ah, oh, you're just a biscuit away from being a tight end. You're, you're going to be, yeah. over there. but like, I was like, no man, this guy could just be like a real giant. He's at the not receiver. that stiff. Like you expect no. this guy, when you see that type of prospect, you always expect the same thing. Or at least I go in Nick, my pre, and this is a, you know, a prejudice, but my prejudice is always going to be, this dude's going to be look stiff out there. Right. Like he's going to look stiff running routes and he doesn't look that stiff. Johnny Wilson. He's an intriguing, but I don't know where he would go in a draft, but I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about him, those types of receivers and him. As we Absolutely. Get through it. Well, let's transition to the position that a lot of people think Johnny Wilson will be the tight end position. And we talked about Theo Johnson, the Penn state tight end on the last yes. podcast. Uh, I, uh, I liked him before the combine. I like him even more after the, Did combine. we say that on pod or off pod? I felt like we talked about it before we No, that recording. was, that was on podcast. I okay. believe. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, we Theo both had him as tight end two before the, before the combine. I don't know if I had him at tight end two because I haven't seen enough tight ends okay. yet, but I, I like Theo. I liked him. I had him as a second round grade. He's so, just tight end two for me of like the ones I've, I feel like I agree with you until I get a full grasp position. None of this matters, but like he was just the guy that I liked a lot more than the, than the consensus. Yeah. He's a, he's a Canadian prospect who ended up going to Penn state six foot six, about 260 pounds, big ass hands, long arms production from a yardage standpoint was not great. Right. In Penn state's offense, but he was a red zone threat. I think he had like seven touchdowns this year, which, which was, you know, a decent amount. And, and you watch him, he has some wiggle to him again, similar to Johnny Wilson, He's not a stiff out there. No. He had a four five seven with a one five five ten vertical jump, a thirty nine and a half with a ten five broad, and a seven one five three cone wow. with a four one nine short shuttle. So, pretty damn good testing numbers, good size production. Again, it wasn't showcased at Penn State, but he had the red zone production, which is very important. And just turning on his tape, I thought there was uh, more blocking than than yes. one would expect. And um, he's a nimble receiver who has good hands. So I, I do like Theo Johnson. I think he was a winner. I think a lot of people, Nick, have said with Theo Johnson, like, is this just another Zach Coons? I remember last year was Zach Coons. Yeah. I just don't think that's the case. Like from what I've seen so far, I haven't seen a lot, but from what I've seen, like, and especially the clips that I've seen breaking down, Penn block, State guy too, right? Who was Penn State guy that transferred yeah. Old Dominion? Yeah. They just seem to get crazy athletes there all the time that test crazy in the combine. But this dude can actually block, and I think that frame that he has with what he's already shown as a blocker could mean that he could actually be like a next level blocker when you're, cause when it's a difference, you have such a higher ceiling as a blocker when you're six foot six, two sixty like he was or two fifty nine. Then the guys who are like six, four, six, three, and maybe, you know, two thirty five or two forty five, or it's just such a different ceiling to me as a blocker. Cause when you're six, six, two sixty, like he is like, and obviously he still has room to grow into his frame based on his age. Like he could be the type of guy that takes out the ends. Like he's the type of guy that you have, like you need a specific kind of end on the field to set the edge, or he's going to just take, take over um you know similarly to how we've seen from some of the better blocking tight ends in the nfl but it's not just like you mentioned all the numbers which are insane basically a lead across the board he was the most athletic tight end in the history of the combine nick out of 1105 yeah. prospects no one's ever been as athletic as this dude is in addition to also having some pretty decent tape as a blocker and i'll say one thing about the receiving stats thing and i'm not going to bury this because i know we got some penn state fans who watch this podcast but i gotta tell you i don't think he's christian hackenberg part two it's way too early to say that, but Drew Aller was god awful last year in the games I saw. The Ohio State game, he had a 33% completion rate. It was one of the worst quarterback games I've ever seen. And his ball placement was just bad across the board. And not just was his ball placement was just bad, Nick. Like oddly bad for a quarterback prospect who's as ballyhooed as him. Like he's supposed to be like the next great thing. And by the way, the year just before Penn State's thing. Like Penn State fans no. are gonna get mad at me. Penn State, like I feel like they always have these really hyped four or five star quarterbacks who always end up just falling flat on their face. It's been their thing, but I think he still has a chance because he looks so yeah, good his first year's freshman year when they played him like a few snaps he would come in and look like Roth I was like oh shit it's the next Ben Rothsberg and then last year was god awful and just he just the way I watched him when he played he didn't utilize the field and he did not see the field well at all so like if somebody gets lost in that offense from a production standpoint it's kind of like the Michigan thing with me years ago with Nico Collins when we liked him as a prospect Nick I'm like I watch that offense and I'm like how much of this can I how much of the lack of production can I blame on the receiver it's pretty much all just the quarterback and the system's fault for no production. Like, I'm not going to blame a receiver for that type of thing. And, you know, we've seen this with the Giants at times as well and other teams that we follow in the NFL. So, Theo Johnson, interesting. What about a couple of these other tight ends that people people were talking up in the combine, Nick? Oh, I felt like Dallin Hooker or Holker from Colorado State. It was just cool watching him double fist the balls. Did you see yeah. that? Yeah, so that was that was a cool little um a cool little moment in combine history. I thought Rich Eisen did a really good job uh, articulating about the moment, but uh, he ran like a four seven eight. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, Tip Ryman, who had a great uh, combine from a testing standpoint. I believe he's the the individual who doesn't believe birds are real. He thinks that they're they're uh, that they land on on um 
an electrical wires and they charge no, no, the, which... the, 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 the yeah what is it the you know the telephone poles and stuff are, are recharging stations for the yes birds, yes the I, I love a I love a, I love a, I love a good thought like that have so... you ever seen a baby pigeon <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't yeah, go I climbing right. up, climbing up a tree to look for the nests. But no, uh, yeah. I felt like that was interesting. But more importantly, I love the way he tested. I don't think he can catch. Um, yeah, <laughs> he dropped a lot of balls, and it looked very unnatural. Look like he was struggling with the football. But damn, did I love the way he was moving the bag in the in the blocking drills, man! And he did a lot of power, very low, explode, low to high, good firm base, drive, drive, drive. Looked very powerful in the in the bag drill, which I appreciate from a tight end. I also liked um, Ben Sinat, who is uh, one of Sal Sal's big fan of. I think this is more of a day three type of option. Six foot four, two hundred and fifty pounds, nimble, good receiver, good hands. Now I think he jumped 10, 6 in the broad. Yeah, right here, ten six in the broad and forty inches. In the vert with a three really or good. a six, a six, eight, two, three cone and a four, two, three t- uh, short shuttle. So he can move. And when you yeah. turn on some of the tape that I have seen, I, I need to do an evaluation on, but I've seen a dude who can move and can maneuver in, in tight spaces to get open and get away from defenders in zone coverage. So Ben Sinat's another one I wanted to throw out there. And I want to say something along those lines, because Ben Sinat, we mentioned Theo Johnson, most athletic tight end in the history of the combine. Ben Sinat's up there, too. He was the 29th most athletic tight end in the history of the combine uh, from 1987 to 2024. Like like you said, the agility was great with the shuttle and the three cone. The explosiveness was great with both the vertical and the broad. Ran a 4.68, which for the position is pretty damn good. It's not elite, but it's just under elite. And same thing for the for the, for the shot, uh, 20. And then the 10-yard split was pretty elite, that quickness. And I want to say one thing. People don't, I don't think everybody realizes this or remembers this, but a big thing that led the Giants on to Daniel Bellinger, like, yeah, we watched the tape and we we're like, this dude can block and like he likes to block and that's fun. But it's the, he was, he had a really good relative athletic score. Like he tested really well, Bellinger, in all of these same things like a player like Sanat tests well. And, and I know the Giants are putting credence in that tight end position. And we, like I said at the beginning of this part of the last one, Josh Norris has done some great research on this draft analyst, Josh Norris, and he's shown that like, out of all the positions, athleticism translates more at tight end than any other position from, from college to the NFL. And it makes sense because it's the toughest position, in my opinion, to translate to from the college game to the NFL. You're going against setting the edge against 230-pound ends to setting the edge against 260 minimum there. And it's tough. You have to block. You have to a two-way player. But, you know, the Giants prioritize that with Bellinger. And, yes, we haven't seen it at all times. In my opinion, it's because the quarterback play and the offensive line play and the bad, you know, just – times where Bellinger should be getting the ball that just didn't, but that could come in the future for him. And the giants could be looking at guys like Sinat if they're around on day three because of this, because their athleticism and because of how that might translate into the NFL. And I would like that. Now, Sal, you can correct me if I'm wrong. If you're listening, I I don't know how Ben Sinat blocks. So that's one thing. I think on the bag drill, like I watched, um, on the back draw, Cade Stover from Ohio State, Tip Ryman, and then Brevin Span Four, because really paying attention to this back draw. They uh the, the back draw is when it's just a, ba- a weighted bag in front of them, and they explode low to high like they're a wide tight end, and they drive it off the ball. Like those three tight ends I listed, I was like, damn, those guys get good pop. I thought Theo Johnson was was okay, I believe, um, doing so as well. Ben Sinat, not as much. Devin Culp, not as much. Devin Culp was ran a four four seven uh, tight end from Washington, and I love a speedy tight end. I love a speedy big guy, so I wanted to tip my cap to him as well. So uh, Sal, let me know how Ben Sinat is as a blocker because I'm a uh, I'm personally I haven't seen the film yet. We'll have to get to that. Um, all right, now let's talk about the two positions that every that just st- stole the combine: wide receiver and offensive line. This class is just loaded Stupid. on both, specifically offensive tackle, but. My God, is this class loaded? I want to start with wide receiver, Nick. And, you know, you can start anywhere you want. We, we're not going to talk much about Harrison. The, uh, Matt, uh, Malik neighbors are Harrison. They didn't really do much at the combine, especially from a testing standpoint. So let's just get right into the third receiver, who I think, honestly, and I'm not done with this evaluation yet. As much as I love Malik neighbors, and you knew I would, Nick, from like that style of receiver, that Antonio Brown has, I don't know, man. Roma Dunze is just like, right up there for me with him, especially after the combine, how he looked in the drills, how smooth he is. This is a prospect that just to me, the, the floor for Roma Dunze is as high as it, it's higher than neighbors floor. Um, maybe the ceiling's not quite there, but I kind of think it might be, 
and just give you some numbers on Romo Dunze. So in 2023, I just want to talk about how productive he was first, because that's going to go into it. And then I'm going to get to the combine. He had 92 catches, 1,640 yards, 15 touchdowns. He led the all of college football in deep catches, led all of college football in deep yards, Romo Dunze. First in contested catches. You can throw him the ball up in space and in, with a contested catch position, he'll come down with it. Hunt, the best grade against man coverage of all wide receivers in college football, 90th percentile grade versus zone. And then a 2.93 yard throughout run, which by the way, I've mentioned on this podcast and a lot on the fantasy football co- podcast, Nick, there's no more stickier stat year to year than yards per route run. It shows some of the best receivers that break out. And he was 95 percentile there. Then he comes to the combine, Nick. And he's the 96th most athletic receiver of 3,063 wide receivers who have been in the combine history. Just blows up the combine, dude. Despite, let's take a look at this right now. I'm going to go over some of these numbers because they're just insane. Six foot two, just under six foot three, 212. Ran a 445 at 212, 6'3. A 20-yard split of 259. Oh, 10-yard split, dude, of 152. Like he's insanely quick. 39 inch vertical. The 403 short shuttle, though. That was the one that like stole this. Like everyone when they saw that was like, holy shit, Roma Dunze is running a 40.03 short shuttle. That shows his quickness, change of direction. The 10 yard split shows his burst off the line of scrimmage, dude. This dude is like a, a near perfect prospect for me. And I know he might not even end up as my wide receiver one or two, which is crazy in this class, Nick. But Roma Dunze, man, I was so impressed with what I saw in the drills and just everything from him. Yeah, everything I saw from Roma Dunze made me uh, more inclined or more interested. But again, like I didn't really even need that because no, I mean, yeah. I've, I've watched Washington's tape. I haven't, I haven't evaluated it, but I watched it just on Saturday. I knew this guy was going to be an absolute stud. I knew it was if the Giants go receiver and don't get Marvin Harrison Jr., it's going to come down to him and it's going to come down to Malik Neighbors. And I think both of those guys are two different wide receivers. Both are destined to be studs in the NFL. Both are much better, in my opinion, than a lot of the receivers who were in last draft class. Yes. I brought up the uh, historic three cone or I mean the historic short shuttle because you, you brought up Roma Dunze. Well, I don't know who ran the fastest short shuttle in combine history. Edelman? The, no. no, good guess though. He's a receiver who was a teammate of Edelman's. It was a 2014 draft class. He's bounced around the league. He might be worth the most of any wide receiver ever in terms of being traded and garnering first round picks because of it being traded. Oh, uh, first round picks. Oh, yeah, man. He's been traded like three times for first round picks to the Patriots, to the Rams. He was on the Texans. Oh, it, he was drafted by the Saints. Robert. No. Oh, Brandon Cooks. Brandon Cooks, man. A three oh, eight one. Oh, yeah. Short shuttle. That's it. That, that checks out, too. Oh, I loved Jay, his exactly. tape coming out. I, I loved him as a Dude, JSN, JSN, Jackson Smith and Jigba ran a three nine three last year. I saw it. Yeah, that's crazy, man. Be, now, I remember be, that. It, that's crazy to me, Nick. But then I look at a four, so that's three nine three, right? And that was insane when when Jason did it. But dude, Roma Dunze, a Dun, is it a Dunze or a Dunze? I think it's a Dunze. Whatever, we're just gonna have to go with it. Yeah, it's okay. Roma Dunze, a four point oh three is not that far off JSN's like crazy number, and he's doing it at six foot three. You know, like it's just like a two twelve. It's just different. It's different. He shouldn't be able to move the way he does, and to also have be in the four fours for the forty, which I think was great for him. I just think this like there's a chance that I actually end up having him over neighbors. I didn't think that was even possible when I first started watching neighbors, but I want to watch more Dinsey, which has allowed me to watch more panics, which I need to, which I know I need to watch, watch more of like, I've seen more of neighbors than a Dunze by a lot because I watch a lot of Jaden Daniels. But once I get into more of Dunze with Penix, like, I don't know, I may end up having him wide receiver too. Cause he just, he looks like a surefire hit to me. Not that neighbors won't be, but man, is a crazy class. And then, you know, getting to some other guys, I don't want to bury the lead of the combine, which is, you know, that Xavier worthy broke the combine record with a four, two, one 40 yard dash. And it's not just the 40 yard dash. This dude scored a nine, four, two, uh, on his RAS. That's a hundred. He's the hundred eighth most athletic receiver in combine history out of 3,063 guys. And, you know, he's going to enter the NFL, which is such a good profile from that standpoint, but it's not like, this guy was not productive at the collegiate level. That's sometimes what happens to me, in my opinion, Nick. I see these guys who burst through and have a great 40 time, but they're not that productive. So he had 26 touchdowns in three years in college. Yeah. Like he can ball out too, and he's productive. What, what do you think of Worthy? Does he at all enter the mix at you for you as someone who might be interested in the Giants like targeting or drafting at some point? I mean, I'll always be interested. I think there's mm-hmm. different receiver types I would want. Xavier Worthy is similar to Jalen High. I don't want to be lazy and pigeonhole him like that. But Worthy has, if I'm not mistaken, pretty bad drop issues, right? 
And he came into college football, had 12 touchdowns as a true freshman. He's only 20 years old, played his three seasons, is going to the NFL. I love that speed. I really do. Need to watch a little bit more Texas offense. But I think there's receivers like Neighbors, who's a different type of skill set, I think, and Adunze, who are, they're going to cause first round picks. But I think they offer a little bit, um, well, they definitely offer a little bit more. Whereas Jalen Hyatt is is pretty similar to Xavier Worthy, where he's just obviously a little bit faster <laughs> than, yeah. than Jalen Hyatt, I'd say. But um, I think they're they're similar in skill sets. Can they coexist? Sure. Are there other receivers that I think are comparable in skill set to Worthy, but aren't as quick that I would be maybe a little bit more inclined to invest in to yeah. to to better complement the New York Giants roster? I think I think so because again, it's a very deep class, and I think with this combine, Worthy is going to skyrocket. I don't know if he's going to be a first round pick, but are the Giants going to oh, spend a second he, round? He pick? Will- Definitely be a first round pick. Okay, you think so? The way I mean, the NFL operates, like I, feel I don't like it's think you're. Lock. I don't think you're wrong, but again, I think the NFL is reactionary. And it, if his film checks out, again, I haven't seen his tape. I know he's productive, but where a lot of those screens, I don't know. I think you saw what the Bengals did with John Ross. That didn't work out. That was a mistake. I'm not saying Xavier Worthy is John Ross, but I'm saying right. a lot of these teams might not be as reactionary to just draft them off of this in such a deep class where there are so many other receivers. So. He will he'll probably be a first round pick, right? But uh, I, I just, um, I don't think the Giants are going to be in a position to do that unless they right. trade down. And even then, I still think there's going to be just way too many other positions I'm going to be interested in. But again, got to watch his tape. So this is kind of a, a half-assed, um, a half-assed uh, description. Oh, but I, I get what you're saying, Nick. Because look, I mean, like, there's there's some drawbacks too. He was 165 pounds. That's really insanely light, honestly, for an NFL player. And that's the 30.35 percentile among all receivers. 165. That's bad. Um, but of course, like the way I look at it, Nick, and I'm not sure if the Giants will be, and I'm only asking that because he might be on the board, in my opinion, potentially. If things, I doubt it now, the way the NFL operates, but I thought before the combine he might be on the board at 39. Because I, I personally, going into this, when I've, I've watched a little bit of Ewers and I've watched a little bit of Texas, I, for, for projection standpoint, I like Mitchell. I like his other receiver at Texas better for the NFL. I just think there's more X potential there. But the way I think about it, Nick, is when you run a 4 2 2, and you have like pretty solid tape and you've scored touchdowns, you've been productive. The NFL is always one team is going to be like, if we put this guy in our system, he's going to create so much space in the so, middle of the field. Like high kill effect. So much schematically, like they're just going to look at like how this will open up their offense schematically speaking. And I just think some team will make it, but it's not like he like just ran the 40. It's kind of crazy, dude. He ran a one, five flat, 10 yard split, a two, four, eight, 20 yards. Split. This dude's sick fat. And then 41 inch vertical elite. And then a 10 foot, 11 inch broad, like just like crazy explosive athlete. This guy, he's not just a straight line runner. Um, so he didn't do the agility testing, which I think was interesting, but he was obviously the story of the combine. So I thought we'd bring him up. I think with, you're right though, Nick, with where the giants are at in the draft and what they need with Hyatt on the roster, he's probably someone we, we probably won't be looking into. Yeah. I am curious about him being a first round pick. Cause again, I don't even know if he's, I don't think he's the best receiver on his team with AD Mitchell either. there. And A.D. Mitchell was a stud at Georgia. He transferred to Texas and he was a stud again. And you just, again, man, that's why this draft class is, is so intriguing to me is because there's so many damn receivers. There's Ricky Purcell, right? You have Lad McConkey, who you watch some of that guy's route running. It's, it's, it's oh phenomenal. God, that one clip that's going around on Twitter right now where he, where he is kind of running a wheel and then he just sinks his weight like he's going to curl yeah. and it just totally gets the quarterback to bite Crazy. down and he's just upfield. It's so quick. It's so smooth, the transition, right? And then Roman Wilson is another player, the kid from Michigan, who is very fast. You have Xavier Leggett from South Carolina, another guy who could be a potential exit you can get in the second round. So it's just so goddamn deep, dude. And it's we're exciting. Gonna, and we're going to talk about those two because, uh, well, not, we'll talk about those guys, but we're definitely going to talk about Lad McConkey, who I think a lot of people looked at and gave a billing, a certain billing to before this combine that's just not going to be a fair billing anymore because his athleticism is through the charts. I want to talk about. And then Rick, my big sleeper in this class, Ricky Parasol, who's just not going to be a sleeper anymore because he also was just a lot more athletic than people thought he could possibly be. But before that, I want to talk about a player who I really like in this class. Who you just mentioned before that, and that's where these teammates yeah, were these teammate AD Mitchell from Texas. I know that there's a stat going around. I think Scott Barrett put this out there of like receivers who have not had a thousand yards at the collegiate level um, and just how and first and become first round picks and how many busts there have been from that group. And I get it. 
But if you're going to think of an outlier to me, it, it could very well be this guy, dude. He had, he was the eighth. So he had a 9.98 RAS relative athletic score. He's the eighth most athletic receiver out of 3,063 in combine history. He wasn't as tall as I thought he might be Nick. He was only six foot two and uh, just under six foot two and two Oh five, but at just under six foot two and two Oh five, this dude ran a four, three, four, 40 yard dash with a one, five, two, 10 yard split, a two, five, two, 20 yard split. That's literally elite, elite, elite and a 39 and a half inch vertical and an 11 foot four inch broad jump, which is just absolutely absurd. Like that was almost 10 for the RAS score. He's explosive. He's fast. He's quick. And he's big. This is what X receivers like are made of. Now he still needs to realize all this potential. He's not there yet. Or he'd be a top four, top five pick overall with that kind of like athleticism and size. But I'm looking for that Giants roster, Nick, and I see Wandale Robinson and I see Jalen Hyatt in their future. And I see that they need an Adunze type or an AD Mitchell type, someone who's six foot two or six foot three and could really play that ISO X position and potentially shift coverage their way. So I'm very interested in Mitchell. I think this probably closes the door on the potential of him being there at 39 before the combine, Nick. I thought maybe he could be there at 39. Now I don't think it's even possible. I don't see how this guy, like, I just don't look at that. The NFL is just not going to let an athlete like that, in my opinion, get out of the first round, but still always possible. But I'm just very intrigued by him. What are your thoughts on Mitchell? I mean, I, I would have to watch a little bit more tape. I just sure, sure. highlights, yeah. but at the combine, yeah, four, three, four from a six foot two, 205 pound guy with long arms. Hands are a little bit on the smaller side, nine inches. It's not yeah. like terrible, but it's like about average. I, I like a receiver and offensive lineman with big ass meaty hands. But I, I think he, uh, from um, what we're talking about, I'm trying to like think of a comp in my head. I know NFL.com has him as George Pickens. We need to watch tape to substantiate I can see that. that comp. I could see is that he as comp physical. Is he as physical as George? Pickens? I don't know if he's as fit. I, I got to see more of him too, Mitchell, but I just can see yeah. that comp like the, the way they move on the field and their lengths. I can definitely, I, that's interesting to me, but he's, I think he's more explosive and faster than, than Pickens, which is crazy to say. I don't know if he's as physical. Well, they were teammates too. I think. Yeah. As well, they, they, yep. they would have been there at the same time. So yeah, I mean, color me intrigued for sure. Yeah. I'm very intrigued by Eddie Mitchell, who I know is screaming off draft boards now um there's a lot of receivers to talk about let's talk about a couple that you met or one that you mentioned lad mcconkey because you know you talked about the clip that's going around twitter of the way he runs his route and sinks in and out of his breaks he's just he's been comp you know the lazy comp is always going to be like the cooper cup comp but you understand why it comes up because he's so good at like manipulating the, the coverage you know tempoing his routes getting in and out of his breaks but then like a prospect like that you don't expect to test as athletically you know as well athletically as he did and yet you know, with the exception of his height and weight, everything else was pretty good across the board. Um, he was five foot eleven and only one eighty six. That's a little light, and some people might think that's slot only. But dude ran a four three nine, Nick. Like, I did not expect Lamb McConkey to run a four three nine. I thought we were looking in the four fives with a one five two ten yard split and a two five seven twenty yard split. The vertical and the broad were were thirty six inches and ten four, which these days is only in in the good range. It used to be considered elite, but as, as I said, the athleticism has just been going crazy and like lately people are getting more athletic but man do you watch him run the drills too he just looks like a smooth receiver and the fact that he has 439 i think makes i just will find it hard to believe that he doesn't get you know this point get picked in my opinion either the end of round one or early day two dude it's again man like i i say this every year I, there's 60 round one picks in people. Yeah, I know. I know. That's the thing. Maybe man. that's a little, maybe it's a little aggressive to say round one, maybe, but earlier day two, I can really see it. I think with his production in college, round one would be a surprise. And you shouldn't always look at that because Georgia was blowing people out. It's not like they're throwing the football in the fourth quarter, you know, so his production is yeah. not going to be as high. But another part of this that I like about Lad McConkey is this guy's going to come in and he's going to be a damn good special teamer for you. Yep. And people will be like, oh, well, that's just like a secondary thing. It's not. Giant fans, you're well aware yeah. of this. It's not because we don't want to put our starting cornerback back there to get mm -hmm. injured because Brian Dable's like, nope, we're just going to put the best guy back there. You know, mm -hmm. like Lad McConkey would be a guy who wouldn't necessarily, if he were to be a giant, say the Giants, say if he falls in the third round or whatever, and the Giants draft him for whatever reason, like Lad McConkey, where would he fit in to the 11 personnel package? I know. There would, that's be, the there, would be a there would be a rotation, right? Mm -hmm. There would be a rotation, which is cool. Mm -hmm. But that means, okay, yeah, go get your ass out there and be our damn punt returner. Be a damn good punt returner. That's excellent. And Wandell, go out and you run the first two plays lad you're good all right get your ass out there and you know right. it gives you more options and i think a football player like lad mcconkey and you can throw roman wilson into this as well who's also very fast um very um good route runner crafty route runner you could always find a spot for him right but i am wondering how joe shane is going to approach this wide receiver class and if he is looking for a specific type which you don't always want to do but 
The Giants got some good damn football players at the wide receiver position, but you don't have that one. And we know Joe Shane put a stress last offseason on finding that one. And then he was like, you know what? We don't necessarily need to find a one at wide receiver, but we can get a one through Darren Waller. And now that Darren Waller's on right. the fence, do you look to get Ada Dunze? Do you look to get a neighbors or maybe even a Brian Thomas or a player like that who has a little bit more right. of a one quality than a McConkey? Exactly. Because look, look, you, you got Wandale, you got Hyatt. Hyatt can probably play outside, but I think it's still to be determined. He still needs to win more outside. He needs to get yeah. more physical. He needs to get his play strength up. Like, and he needs to work on his routes. Like, that's that's the truth of it. And if not, he's going to end up being like a speedy slot you can move in or even just a rotational player. Wandell, I think, can be their slot. But <clears throat> McConkey, yeah, he has the 4 3 9 40 yard dash, which is cool. But does he have the size to play on the outside? He really didn't check in well from a height or weight standpoint. But you know, if we're looking at the Giants, Nick, we kind of need that X receiver at this point. We kind of need the prototypical guy with size on the outside, which leads me to another player who, to me, is my clear wide receiver four in this class from the what I've seen so far. And then combine that with the the, the production I saw on tape when I watched Jaden Daniels and then combine that with the insane combine he just put out there. And that's Brian Thomas Jr., the teammate of Malik Neighbors, who is the 10th most athletic receiver out of 3,063 in combine history, we just keep getting like, it's insane how this combine shook out. Nick, we're getting some of the most athletic prospects in the history of the NFL since they started charting this from the combine in 1987 in one class. And Thomas is one of them. He's six, six foot, just under six foot three in two Oh nine ran a four, three, four, a four, three, four dude had six foot three, two Oh nine. Like what? That would be the number one receiver in most class. That would eat. I would never draft JSN Zay flowers or Jordan Addison. Personally, the way I draft Nick, um, I'm looking for upside with my picks. I'm looking for an X. I would never draft any of those three over Brian Thomas. Personally, two, five, three, 10, uh, 20 yard split one, five, three, 10 yard split at six, three dude. And then a 30 and a half inch vert and almost 11 foot broad jump. So he's got explosiveness too. And then what did he have? 17 touchdowns last year in a single season for LSU and just looked freaking awesome every time I watched Aiden Daniels. I mean, this dude, dude, man, he he's my I love this prospect. He is um wildly fast. Like yeah. very fast. And, and long big. strides and big. And you're right. He's I do feel like, at least in the um in the like Twitter world, he's getting slept on a little bit because Malik Neighbors. He was. Are- yeah, now I don't think that's going to yeah. be the case, right? But turn on the tape that I have seen. I'm like, yo, that dude is a long strider. He makes contested catches, if I'm not yep. mistaken. At least I've seen him make contested catches yep. in the end zone, like ripping the ball away from guys. So I'm right there with you, man. He's got upside on tape, Brian Thomas Jr. And I don't know, like the Giants, the only way, if I, to me, when you look at this prospect as a whole, I don't think there's any way he makes it at the top 15. I'm actually be surprised if he makes it at the top 10, maybe 11, maybe it depends on the quarterback frenzy and the tackles, but the giants trade back. This is like one of the prime targets I'd be looking at Nick, if they trade back in round one and move that way. A um, couple other guys to talk about a um, couple guys. We'll get the stock down in a second. Let's get to one more stock up. And this is a, a big sleeper of mine. That's Ricky Parasol. I don't know if you've seen a lot of him, the Florida wide receiver. Just like the senior bowl. Oh, so yes, you did get to see him at the senior bowl. I, he was a guy that I, I came on to as my, one of my biggest sleepers in the class early on. I just watching his tape, you'll see him make spectacular one-handed grabs where he just shows off crazy, crazy body control and concentration and then hands in the air. And you're like, okay, that's that type of prospect. I did not expect him to be an athletic prospect, Nick. I thought he would be more of like a, maybe like a Charlie Jones level athleticism, but just somebody whose tape I love to watch. But no, somehow, dude, this is another one of these athletic prospects. I don't understand how all these guys tested as well as they did at the wide receiver position. But he had a nine seven eight RAS score, seventieth most athletic receiver out of out of the you know the three thousand plus I mentioned ever. I mean, six foot one, one eighty nine, ran a four four one. I did not see that coming. With a forty two inch vertical, that I saw coming. If you watch his, if you watch Ricky Pearson, you'll see him high point balls all the time at Florida. So that I saw coming with a t- almost eleven foot broad jump, and then the shuttle and the three cone, dude. shuttle and a six, six, four, three cone, like agility change of direction. I just, I look at that Nick and I'm, and I don't know how this is going to go, Nick, but just looking at his combining what I've seen on him in tape, dude. And then these athletic numbers across the board from just straight line speed, the jumping and explosiveness with the vertical and the broad, and then the ability to change direction at elite levels. I don't see how this guy makes that at round one. Now, I guess he probably will, because like you said, there's only 32 picks and there's so many other players in positions he's not really talked about as a round one guy. 
But if this guy's sitting on the board at 39 and the Giants go go receiver, that, that's not a reach to me. That's like a pick I'm good with making. I like this player a lot. I think he can be much better at the NFL level than he was at the college level. I know we said about Charlie Jones, that still remains to be seen. And he was a different kind of prospect. He was a day three all the way. And I still think he's going to make his way with the Bengals. But this is a guy, Parasol, who I think will be better at the NFL level than college level. So keep me in mind on him, Nick. I'm going to be on him all draft season. I already know it. And he's going to be a guy I like for the Giants a lot. And the guy drafting all my fantasy football dynasty mock drafts. He went in the late third round in our rookie only draft before the combine. Just showed how um, Arizona State transfer too. Yeah. No, that's it's funny. Like, that's a lot of these guys are Arizona yeah. State transfers because they were there with Herm Edwards. I, I was living right. in Arizona at that time and all those allegations came down. And I remember like turning on sports radio and I was like, oh shit. And like Jane Daniels was there. like a lot of those guys just ended up uh -huh. fleeing. And next thing I know, they're playing in the SEC and they're like all studs. <laughs> it's yeah. just like they couldn't get it done at Arizona State. <laughs> yeah. Or Tempe. Uh, let's talk also about a couple more prospects. Two, two people that I think had you know, at least relatively speaking, down days or stock down type days. I don't know how much to put into it, but just from the NFL standpoint, one uh, is a player who I just, at least from what I've seen so far, I haven't seen enough, Nick, but I just didn't kind of like before the prospect as much as some other people liked. Um, but, you know, did it, it was just not as big as people expected him to be the combine. That's Troy Franklin out of Oregon. I know a lot of people love him. Some people think he's like a top 15, top 20 pick. I don't know if he'll get there for me, but I think he surprised people by only being 176 pounds, Nick. I don't think people are expecting that. Um, broad jump wasn't great. He did run a 4-4-1, but I think a lot of people expected him to maybe run like 4-3-4, like a Brian Thomas or a 4-3-2. Uh, you know, he's, I mean, he, this is even slower than like um, a few of the prospects that we were just never expecting him. I think, again, McConkie ran a 4-3-9 and Franklin's running a 4-4-1. I don't think anyone would have guessed that he would run slower than McConkie. So any thoughts on that or, or your thoughts on anything you've seen from Franklin? Have you seen anything? Um, Not, not too much. I, I wrote about him a little bit on the, uh, the preview of, of okay. the day because you know i uh i like just familiar with him pac 12 football but i didn't expect him to be 176 either uh 161 10 yard split was a little bit surprising that, that was, was bad too that was immediate. what people really forgot about that yeah and then i also i brought this up i think last episode the, the gaunt lady was just sloppy like running like all the oh, like, yeah. like, like if you watch pierce Saul, you could see like that's a really good gauntlet drill the last at the end of pierce Saul's gauntlet drill he kind of sways a little bit mm -hmm. you just want to see someone to maintain that line Stay and, that line Yep. And, and Franklin, man, he's like running like three yards beyond all the line. Over the place, yeah, all dude. over the place, dude. Looks like a it drunk was like he was just, Someone on Twitter was like, Troy Franklin looked like he was drunk running the golf. Yeah. Like, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's just very wide. You don't love this. It's interesting. Um, and then Keon Coleman was an interesting one because I wrote about him uh, for, for and he's a player I like a lot more than consensus. Keon Coleman, that's a wide receiver from Florida State. I wrote about him at CBS Sports. I think it jumped out at first and everyone's like, oh my God, this is a horrible combine for him because he ran a 4-6. It actually ended up being a 4-6-1 official. It was 4-6-4 reported it as it was a four six one official so once you're into the four six people are really scared um but after that nick like after running that bad 40 the rest of his and, and the 20 yard split was not good either right but everything else was tested out pretty well he was six a full six foot three over six foot three 213 with a one five four ten yard split which is much better than you expect so the quickness is there 38 inch vertical almost 11 foot broad jump great great there so I don't think it was as bad as people expect there. And then you mentioned it earlier, Nick, he ran the gauntlet drill faster than any wide receiver in, in the entire combine. So that was something to look at. And I just love his tape from what I've seen of him, the little I've seen of him. And just think after the catch, he's amazing. Oh, he's a dog, bro. He's a physical dog. Like I really like Coleman, let him fall in the draft and the giants can scoop him up. So let's quickly go through the offensive line. And there's a, kind of a lot to chew off here. Joe Walt showed up and was more athletic than I think a lot of people expected him to be right and joe all is like you watch his tape i i love this tape i didn't i didn't think he was you know as commanding with his hands i didn't think there was a yep. like, pop with his hands that that i wanted you could check out my evaluation of him over there on a on um not sb nation which one on uh, sports illustrated on, on patricia trainer's site but damn did he show up big and damn did he show off athletic out there crazy i mean he's six foot and Look, I think the not the knock that I've seen on Alt is what you just said is he has physical at the point of attack. Is he like one of those types of old linemen that you get the road graders? He may never be that. I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean he's not going to be an amazing NFL player. But to be six foot eight and a half, which is insane to begin with, and three twenty one, and then want to run a one seven three seven uh, ten yard split, dude, and almost under four in the forty yard dash. In addition to also running the shuttle four five one in the three cone seven three one at six foot eight. Like, it's just absolute insanity to be able to do that, Nick. And I think that's what really stood out for a lot of people, like how athletic he was. 
Um, and so it was interesting to see. I think that kind of locks him in as a tier one blue chip type of player. In addition to the tape that you obviously discussed, I want to talk a little bit about the 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 story of the day. And I know we're going to work through fast, and we may do another show where we talk more more, more tackles or stuff about the combine. But Amarius Mims, I mean, oh, dude, this is just crazy. insanity, Amarius Mims. I so let me tell you the one that stands out. He had a four three three short shuttle, right? And if you listen to Josh Norris, a guy I reference a lot, and you look at all the, the research, the short shuttle drill for offensive linemen has predicted so much future success. It's been 24 of 25 guys have been started. You're getting Charles Leno in round seven, and he's starting a million games in the NFL. And it goes through like every round. It's been hit, hit, hit. Very few misses. You have the miss from the Eagles took Dillard, and you have like a, some misses in there, but like a lot of hits. So keep in mind, keep in mind the short shuttle. This dude had a 4 3 through short shuttle. This was the same time as running back Joe Mixon, okay? Yeah. Only seven offensive linemen, this is according to Josh Norris, since 1999 have recorded a faster short shuttle in the history of the combine, and the heaviest one them of one was 304 pounds. The only one who's even close to his size at 330 was Ryan DM, who ran the short shuttle. Let's give a read now, Nick, on what, and since 2010, just 28 offensive linemen have recorded a 447 short shuttle or better at the NFL, and he was 433, okay? Um, and Let's take a look at how big he was. Cause now I don't have it in front of me and I just want to get it real quick. Um, Amarius Mims, how big he was. 340, Nick, six foot seven and a half, 340, running a short shuttle four through three. How is that even possible, dude? I have no idea. It's like the type physical. of body control that you need to do that. And he came up a little lame uh on the um on the 40 yard dash, I think his second attempt. And I'm not sure if the three cone was performed before that or not. I'm honestly a, a little bit uncertain, but I just wanted to mention that. And there was a couple other guys, I think that also got dinged up through the combine. So that's something to monitor, but Holy crap. It's some, somebody's going to fall in love with that. Someone's going to fall in love. Right. Dude, guys got such big arms, such a large human being. And I think he's only played or started like 11 games at Georgia. If I'm not mistaken. I don't have that in front of me, but I think I remember hearing that. So, there's going to be a little bit of inexperience there, but offensive line coach is going to want to work with that. And yep. dude, dude, when you move like that, that's just, it's just crazy stuff. And a couple other names to mention, by the way, we had six new members to that list. And there was only like 30 to begin with the list. I discussed those list of guys who had the, you know, the, the short shuttle drill to a certain, I think it's four, four, seven is the, is the breaking point for when you 28, I think it's since 20, since 2010, just 28 offensive linemen have recorded a 447 short shuttle or better at the combine, and 24 of them went on to start games in the NFL, and most of them started a lot of games in the NFL. It's just a crazy, crazy trend. I don't know if it means anything. It could just be a short, small sample size, but six new people. There was only 28 since 2010, and then six players in this class. It's a crazy athletic class are now added to the mix. And now added to the mix. Amari Sims, Amari Sims, I should say, Tanner Bordellini. Wisconsin interior offensive lineman, Kansas guard Dominic Pooney, NC State guard uh, center Dylan McMahon, and USC guard Jarrett Kingston, and Arkansas guard Brady Latham. Just some names to keep in mind, people who could potentially be, you know, in the mix for value picks at the offensive line position based on how well they move in the short shuttle. And it does kind of show you how well they can move in space. One more thing, and we could wrap up, Nick. I know we went a little long, so I'm just going to throw one more thing. I mentioned earlier, this is one of the most athletic draft classes I've seen across the board. It doesn't stop at off to offense tackle. Joe Alt was the 13th most athletic offense tackle since 1987 at 1,314 tackles. To TAC Fauga, the guy at Oregon State who a lot of people love. I knew I messed that up. The 74th most athletic tackle of, of 1,314. 9.4 RSS. Fashanu from Penn State. The 75th most athletic out of 1,314 in the history of the combine. Fountanu out of Washington. The 80th most athletic. Like, he this looked good like, in the drills too, man. He looked good, dude. These are all going to be first round picks. It's impossible for them not to be, in my opinion. Then if you also add Mims to that mix and you add a fifth, looking at five tackles that just are almost, because I don't think Mims can move like that, dude, and not be a first round pick. I just know the NFL. Like, do you think he's lasting? Like, maybe, but I just don't see it happening. It's just because he also had people like his tape. Like I saw Jeremiah talking about he's not bad on tape either. That's five tackles off the board locked in in addition to the six, seven, eight receivers locked into round one. Right. And so it's like 
it's interesting. And I know Matt Miller discussed this. We'll wrap up here, Nick. But he's like, I don't think you should go along the the company line of let's wait at ride receiver or tackle because there's going to be. He's like, I think these guys are all coming off the board inside the top 40. <laughs> bang, 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 bang. And I really agree with him. I think NFL knows the important positions. Wide receiver and tackle are two of the most important positions. They make the most money. You want to draft them high. You want to pay. You want to take them high and you want to hit on them. And so I think if the Giants want these players, one might fall to 39 for sure. Um, but I think they should come up and get him in round one as well, dude. And there's even like guys like Rosengarten who ended up running yeah. the fastest 40, he ran four, nine, two. Like there's so many individuals who might be selecting like the second round. If you're Joe Shane, you don't have a clear answer at right tackle right now. Don't. don't. And I'm not ready to give up on Evan Neal, but if you have a possible, a guy that you have a first round grade on fall to you with your first pick in the second round, do you pull the trigger, man? Especially if 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 one of these like top like six guys end up falling down to you, like that is a decision that Joe Shane has to make. And there's dudes in this draft like we talked about Christian Hayes, the UConn guard, and I know he's just guard specific, but holy crap, man! I like, like him. Yeah, man. He, Christian Haynes, he he ran a five oh three, uh, forty. But you you watch a move, dude. Control, mm-hmm. balanced. That's I've the heard type the of Giants guy. really like him too from multiple people, which is interesting. Yes, Both yes, kid. man. Yeah, yeah, and they they do love that man. He he didn't have a, the best combine. He jumped no. thirty three in the vert, eight six in the broad. But you turn on the tape, you get it. He right? looks good. And, and there's just a lot of players who, in the second round, one of those two second round picks. I just think the Giants are going to be inclined to select an offensive lineman to give Carmen yeah. Brasillo some young players something to work, to work with. with. Right. You know. And then there was also the uh, I can't remember his name, but the the vertical jump, the offensive line position from a South Dakota state tackle was broken. So the, the vert was oh, set. Oh, 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 gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, Garrett, I don't know. Greenfield, I didn't see that. Garrett Greenfield jumped 38, five wow. in the vert at 315 pounds. That's insane. 36, that five insane. by, by Taylor yeah. Grabble of UCF. And then Bo Limmer of Arkansas, the center 36, five as well. It's just freak athletes at the offensive line position crazy all right that's all the time we have the big blue bander podcast i know we went long on these but i hope you enjoyed them we talked a lot of big big concepts as well in in addition to individual guys more draft coming it's the time of year so keep it locked and loaded have a great rest of your week and we'll talk to you soon